Welcome back to Buckeye Talk. Stephen Means and Nathan Baird coming off of Ohio State's season opening win over Indiana, 23-3. to Nathan, uh, uh, first and foremost, this is Monday. I don't know if we're going to actually call this Monday Madness or not. I have that. Maybe I'll have a decision on that at the end of this pod or not. But I know what we're doing. The <laughs> time we're what, done? <laughs> yeah. I know what we're doing on it, and that's what matters the most. I don't, I don't have to have it. I'm like Brian Day. I don't have to name a starting quarterback, but I know what I'm going to do on Saturday with my starting quarterback until my offensive line decides that I can't do that anymore, but we'll get into that. So we're going to break up the game. We're going to use this Monday pod every week to talk about the game. Nathan and I are going to go home. We're going to rewatch it. And then we're going to talk about it. And we're going to split it up into three segments every single week, really four, but three main segments of we're going to talk about quarterback play. We're going to talk about offensive play. We're going to talk about defensive play. And then at the end of each week, that fourth segment in a very short way, we're going to answer the question, do we think that this team looks like a college football playoff caliber team? And that will evolve throughout the season. There will be weeks where it's emphatically no. There will be weeks when it's emphatically yes. And so we'll see where it is on that scale when we get to the end of this pod. But we're going to start with the quarterback. Nathan, I gave Kyle McCord a C immediately after the game when we graded. You gave him, I believe, a B- minus or a C plus. I can't remember which one it was. I, I decided on a C plus. Okay. After watching Kyle McCord, 20 of 33 passing, he didn't have any touchdowns, but he did have 239 yards. Did that grade change? Because I think it changed for me a little bit. Well, like I said uh, at the time, I was really on that fence between C plus, B minus. I could be talked into a, a B minus after the rewatch. I, one of the things that did jump out at me, like, you look at the stats sometimes and 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 make some 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 judgments off of that. If you add on the 24-yard touchdown to Marvin Harrison Jr., where he did nothing wrong, like mm-hmm. um, McCord did everything he was supposed to do and made a nice throw yeah. there. McCord, er, Harrison stepped out. Um, so that's another uh, completion in 24 yards and a touchdown. And mm-hmm. if you give him the yardage on, which was about 39, 40 yards in the air, on the play where Marvin Harrison Jr. drew the pass interference penalty. So I put those two things together right there. Now you're talking about 60 more yards. Now you're talking about a 300-yard passing game. And how different are people mm-hmm. looking at this game? Now, I'm, there's you can, you can make other ways to say, well, okay, but if this happens, then other things are worse. And I understand that. But just those two plays where he did the right thing, if the stats get counted differently, I think we're talking about things very differently. And then even the thing, I did think from the from rewatch, the most overblown thing that happened Saturday was this idea that like Kyle McCord laid Marvin Harrison Jr. out to to die on that throw to the sideline, which I think people were saying yeah. at the time. And I'm like, uh, and in, in real time, I didn't get the best look at that on rewatch. He clearly got drilled as he threw the ball and still hit Marvin Harrison Jr. in the hands. So I thought that was maybe the most overblown thing from just uh, if, if you're giving a overblown social media award of the day, I thought that was probably high on the list. So I would still say in that B minus C plus range, though, because I still saw a handful of plays where I thought he either there were a couple of things he did that I think he's got to clean up. Says the guy who never played Division one quarterback. Uh there were definitely some times where I thought he telegraphed things. And mm-hmm. there was a there was a pass to Mecca Buka early in the game where I thought his eyes were just glued to him the whole time. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe, again, perspective is so important here. He may, if you were to sit here, if you were sitting here, he's not. He's off you know, doing um, important things to try to get better at football. If you were sitting here, he would probably be able to take me on the play and say, like, well, actually, there were, you know, three levels of that route were happening that all happened to be on that side of the field. So my eyes were moving, even though my head wasn't whatever it just, there were, that was one example of others where I thought maybe he telegraphed things a little bit too much. And Indiana was able to capitalize it on a little bit. The team with even better defensive backs will capitalize on it even more. That's something he's got to clean up. And then just some recognition things. There was a, a play where he threw in the double coverage for Ibuka at one point, And I think both, Fleming and Harrison would have been open and and uh, pretty obviously open. Uh, there were a couple other plays where I thought he just that he wasn't recognizing. And and again, first start of the year, first start for him in two years, rust, jitters, all those things. I try to give people some sliver benefit of the doubt for those things. So 
I still would put him in that range because I think it was not the catastrophe that some people are making it out to be. But I also think it's below the standard of what Ohio State wants from its quarterback play, but also probably what it thinks, what Ryan Day thinks Kyle McCord can be eventually if this keeps progressing. Marvin Harrison had eight targets. He should have had 12 because he just – C.J. Stroud, what made him special was the ball placement, but then Ryan Day said it after, I think, the Maryland game in 21. He said he sees the field. He sees it. So while Justin Fields, it maybe took him a year to get to a point where when Ryan Day makes a play call, he knows why – it's being called, and you get the Clemson game where he's just taking the shot to Chris Olave. C.J. Stroud knew that on day one. Now, there were times where it got him in trouble. Like I mean, last year there were times where it got him in trouble because he was so hell-bent on getting that downfield. But a lot of the times, man, if a wide receiver gets over top of the safety, C.J.'s tossing it. Kyle McCord didn't do the same things here. There were a lot of times where he made a good read. It just wasn't the best read. And you brought up the Emeka Buka third down where it's, that's also just time and and down and distance. You probably should go a little further down the field in that situation instead of staying with the safe option, which Emeka Buka is the safe option there. But there's a touchdown down the field because Marvin Harrison Jr. got ahead of the, got behind the wide receivers. I thought he did it at times, though, because we were having this conversation in the press box when it happened, the throw to Julian Fleming, where I think Julian just kind of lost it in the air. I thought that was the right decision. I thought it was yeah, a good yeah, yeah. touch. I thought it was good. Yeah. To, so he did it at times. It just wasn't consistently there. And how much of that is comfort, right? It's your first real game against a – do we see that grow as the, as the season goes on? Because I'm pretty sure he'll look at that film and go, oh, shoot, I had Marvin deep here. Oh, shoot, I had Julian Fleming deep here. But at the same time, he had a throw over the middle to Julian Fleming. I thought that was – he actually had a stretch where – let me pull it up here. Where I thought <clears> – <throat> so it's second and nine, and he's in the shotgun, and that's when he throws the, the pass over the middle to Julian Fleming, which I think was one of the best throws he had that day. And then the next play is the pass interference to Marvin Harrison Jr. But the thing that I, the announcers pointed this out, when he threw that ball to Julian Fleming the play before, Marvin Harrison was actually deep and had one. And so there's a touchdown there, and the announcers even pointed out there. And then the next play, when they go to Marvin Harrison Jr. and he draws the defensive pass interference, <laughs> the announcers are like, I'm pretty sure somebody rung down to Ryan Day. Some Somebody from upstairs said to Ryan Day, hey, Marvin Harrison's winning, and these DBs are squatting. So we probably need to go to him because that was the exact play call was go ball to Marvin Harrison Jr., and at worst you get what we saw in that situation, a defensive pass interference. And then he follows that up with they go no huddle, and he goes over the middle again to Julian Fleming again. It It was there. It just wasn't consistent. And that's why for me – my grade went up to a C plus because that's stuff that just gets better with time after you see it on film, which is why I think Ryan Day was so hell bent on getting these guys the games because you probably weren't going to get that when you're going against the same defensive scheme all the time. Indiana came with you, came at you with a totally different thing than what Kyle McCord has been going up against really for two years now as a backup. So this got him an opportunity to see it against somebody else and see what opens up when you're going against an Indiana defense or just anybody else's defense other than Jim Knowles's. And as I said to the texters too, I think this will be a, to, to, to hold Ryan day to one of his cliches, you know, it's about taking the meeting to the field, taking the film study to the field. Mm -hmm. So this is like the next thing for comic Accord is like, you, there's definitely things to take away from the film in a game like this. How do you then implement it the next time you go out on the field? And I do, though, also, all these things are true, and I think Comic Accord will be better. If, if, you were to, if you were to go out and play Indiana again next week, I would definitely give Comic Accord the edge over Indiana. I think he would be in position to, to cook something up against them and do something. And at the same time, I think that's why they wanted to get Devin Brown some real time in a game because mm -hmm. you want to see what he looks like in a game. You want to give him the same chance to maybe build off of the film. So I don't want to completely rehash that argument. I'm sure we will have it, not not argument, you and I aren't arguing about it, but the discussion about mm -hmm. where things are with this quarterback situation. And we'll have ample time to discuss that, I'm sure, in the week ahead and probably definitely going into 
coming out of Youngstown State because I think we'll probably see some different usage. But I, I couldn't help but think about that too as I was thinking, oh, this is really going to help Kyle McCord. Like he'll see these things on film and he'll know that he can do this and that next time. Uh, but I also think that would have been true of, of Devin Brown if he had had more opportunity. I also thought I was looking at the interception play, which I, I was really surprised the way that they described it on the broadcast too. Like, Oh, he really mm-hmm. made a mistake there. And I'm like, it's fourth down. Like what? I, yeah. I, he was supposed to just throw the ball out of bounds. Like what was he supposed to do? Like he took a shot. Um, it, 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 Ryan Day's right. If it gets returned all the way back, it's, it's a disaster, but uh, the, you know, I that's not a high percentage of, of that happening. So I think you take your shot there, but I did, I did think because even when train fell down, you had both Kate Stover and Joe Royer at like at different levels, still rolling, still, still running routes on that play. And that's who he was trying to force it into. And I'm like, is there a point later in the year where if you have one starting quarterback and he is building a rapport with players, is there that, that sort of um, un non-verbal like almost not mm-hmm. even like just a nod of the head somebody knows that they have to break off their route because maybe they didn't see chip train get knocked down maybe they don't know that things are hot mm-hmm. right there and you've got to make a, a change so there's just so many little nuances that can develop with this offense still and i think what's also the most if you're going to be optimistic after about the offense after a game like that it's that there, if you clean up just a few of these things, the, what do you got here? You've got still just this monster offense, but they do have to be cleaned up. They absolutely have to be cleaned up, and and uh, some of it is offensive line play. But I would also say quarterback play has to be sharper. I think Kyle McCord would also say that, and he essentially did say that when I was standing face to face with him after the game, and, and so were other people. I thought so. I I, I sent this to Nathan. We're gonna do best thing Kyle McCord did, worst thing Kyle McCord did, and it's something that maybe flashed what he might, what might be his special trait. I'll let's start with worst, just so you know we can get that part out of the way, so we can end more on a positive note. Kyle McCord, because I thought he was pretty decent. I thought two things were just like mm, that was bad. The QB power that they ran in the red zone, man, that the holes there. He just goes left when he should have went right. Because Chip Trainum does exactly what he's supposed to do. He takes the linebacker out. So there's nobody. It's not even a foot race. It's just walk through the hole and you score a touchdown. So I, I think that might be actually my pick for the worst thing he did. Yeah. And, it's, and it's not a passing play, but it's, yeah. that was a touchdown. That was the one thing yeah. that you could say he did that took a touchdown off the board. And, and um, I think there were probably some times today where the people who – uh, thought that Kyle McCord was some sort of statue in the pocket or something compared to Devin Brown. I think he dispelled those notions a little bit. He had a mm-hmm. little bit of wiggle on a couple of runs. I mean, short runs. I'm not saying he got out there and, and Justin Fields or, or Michael Vick anybody on Saturday. Certainly not saying that. But he showed he's willing to scramble when it's there and, and can and can do it well. And even like didn't even take the slide there on that one early. He like, kept his yeah. head up and, and, and I don't know how Ryan Day felt about that. Um, and then also like made some off platform plays, like got outside and had to throw off balance and make completions that were tougher. Obviously, the one that Chip trained him late in the game was the one that got the most notice. There was another one I can't remember who he threw back. It might have been Ibuka that came back and made a catch, or maybe it was Fleming. I can't remember on on the other sideline earlier in the game. But I thought you saw him be more with his legs than what you often saw CJ Stroud being last year. So there was that improvement that we were expecting to see from whichever quarterback played. But I think that would probably be my pick for if I had to like the worst thing he did, it was have a touchdown in front of him yeah, and choose not to run for the touchdown and choose to run the other way. Just, I'm sure that I wonder how that, that even, you know, in film, like it's getting critiqued and, and how much do they sort of almost laugh at, at something like that? Because it was just so obvious, uh, but still has, has to be fixed because they want to use that. They, they're going to use him there. Like the, the mm-hmm. CJ Stroud wasn't for the first, what, 24 games of his Ohio state starting career. CJ Stroud wasn't running that keeper. So that is a yeah. new wrinkle. They want Kyle McCord to be able to do that. He can do that, but he's got to make the right read, especially if it's just a walk-in touchdown. I don't even think you say anything. I think you just put it up there. I think you just put the picture, the still picture of the hole up there, and then you look at Kyle McCord for like 20 seconds, and then you just move on with everything else in the day. Because that's it's it's very obvious. 
is once you see it. And, and in the moment, maybe it wasn't that obvious to him, but it's very obvious. So it's that. And then Marvin Harrison probably had three touchdowns in this game. If just the throw is better. It's okay. Yeah, the one where he steps out of bounds, that is the touchdown for sure. There's the one where Marvin is running a crossing route, but the announcers even said that I don't, they didn't think that Marvin think he was going to get the ball there. So maybe he wasn't as ready. I thought yeah. the ball was low and behind him when it should have been high and out in front of him. He's six four. He's six four. He's six four. And then the fade route that everybody sure. knew they were getting ready to run, it's just low. It's, it's low. It, and it's, it, and we talked about it with CJ where he used to be maybe he was sale on some of those. Kyle McCord is just low on a lot of those situations. And so let Marvin Harrison be freaky. I I, I think we oh. overplayed the the two played together for three for three years of high school and maybe that that chemistry will really will translate to college, but also it's been three years since they've routinely been getting reps together. So maybe we overplayed that. But there were, his his ball placement isn't C.J. Stroud level, just like C.J. Stroud's running level wasn't Justin Fields level. So we're going to have to adjust maybe our view of that until it gets to a point where it's something that is more relied upon. Yeah, there's definitely some calibration that's going on here right now, just, mm-hmm. as, you, just as you said that there was with, with Stroud. I actually think, so he was, yeah, two completions to Harrison on eight targets. I think it should have been seven targets. I don't think that throw should have gone to Harrison. I think the, the one you're talking about, the, the front of the end zone throw that was low and behind mm-hmm. him, uh, even though, yes, throwing it high and, and away would have been better, even if it didn't make it more catchable, but it would have been less interceptable because it was definitely a, a dangerous throw the way it was. But I would have gone back over the either, I would have taken either of the two tight end options there. I think you throw to mm-hmm. Joe Royer over the middle who had a step, it looked like, on the guy that um, – was covering him or Kate Sower was completely uncovered underneath. You could have just gone to him mm-hmm. and, and gotten easy yards. And I know that there's people out there who, you know, it's the fine line between like, when are you taking your shot? When are you taking the easy thing, the safe thing? And uh, he's figuring that out. He doesn't have an indefinite amount of time to figure it out, but he's figuring it out. This is just part of the process. Like you've got a game's worth of, of real data that you just went up against real defense um, a defense that, especially when I watched it on rewatch, was uh, impressive at times. Like Indiana's got a couple guys. Casey's and, a dude. Uh, that front, linebacker man, is a Aaron. dude, man. That guy had, he, he's that guy a had dude. A game. <laughs> that guy had a game. Like the, and we'll talk about that more, I guess, in the offensive line part. But um, that doesn't that he didn't also really affect Kama Court all that much though. And like a lot of the, what we're talking about is is sort of independent of what Indiana was doing defensively. It was the play unfolds. And it's being defended, sure, but then, like, what decision are you making between A, B, and C? And I think there were times where he picked the right one and and whistled it. I think there were times he picked the right one, the right one, and maybe didn't get the throw he wanted. And I think there were times where he, as you said before, even if you're making the right call, it's not the optimal call, uh, the optimal read, the optimal decision. And there were times where he made the, the wrong decision. But that's true of... Uh, all quarterbacks to some extent, and it's just a matter of how much you're whittling out the ones that you want back and and getting the ones that maybe in in week one that you didn't see. Um, you do see them when it's week three and it's week seven and it's week nine. So again, just part of the process. But I think there's, I, I, I still think, you know, grading him as a C plus is not a a stellar grade by any means. But I think it also speaks to there being a a foundation within the play that we saw from him. He didn't fail, but it also he didn't necessarily excel. I'll let you go first. What's the best thing Kyle McCord did on Saturday? Yeah, I, I've been I've been going back and forth on that because I, I all along I thought it was the two the two throws over the middle. So this is different to you than the thing that might be his special trait. Yeah, because like the special thing is like hmm. Well, this is just, this is more like a routine. He so, just did this well. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say either, I would say either of those over the middle throws that happened. I guess in the what the third quarter, the one mm-hmm. that he he zipped into Fleming, the one that he threw up the seam to Stover. I think those were both. I mean, they've got to attack vertically, and he has to throw the ball with confidence, which I think he clearly has. I mean, you saw we saw a handful of throws where he's like, okay, I know I can. I, I've got an arm and I can use it. 
And I thought those were, were two examples of that. Like, you know, as much as there were definitely some times where there seemed to be some safe choices, those were two times, especially the one to Fleming. Like that was not, uh, he wasn't wide open there. Like that was into mm-hmm. some traffic and, um, and, and Fleming was in evil, even able to take that throw and then do something with it after the catch, which is an, another you know, crucial part of being a quarterback is being able to, to, to make throws that can then become more than just what is at the point of, of the catch. So I would probably say one of e- either of those two. I thought the 24 yarder that got called back because Marvin Harrison stepped out of bounds was the best thing he did because he didn't wait. He wasn't late. He wasn't staring anything down. He didn't take, cause there was somebody else open too. And he didn't, cause that's, it's the play where, cause to set it up, Ameka Abuka comes in motion and it's almost not really set. It almost could have been a penalty from the get-go because he's kind of moving when they snap the ball, but he's headed up the scene. So the from outside looking in, it looks like the whole point of this is it's too high safety. That's the look they want. Make that high safety make a decision. Are you going to take away Emeka Buka or are you going to take away Marvin Harrison Jr.? Whichever one you don't take away, that's who's getting the ball here, or at least should get the ball. And then Julian Fleming is underneath just in case – they just play it. They just scheme it up well. And so maybe you just need to, you need a, a safety valve there. Ju- the safety valve is open. And earlier in the game, Kyle McCord had been taking the safety valve. This time he doesn't do it. He immediately locks in and makes sure that the safety doesn't move off of Marvin Harrison Jr. And he rips it in there. Great throw, great decision, great timing. And he didn't wait on anything. And that's why I liked it because it wasn't special. To the point of Ryan, you don't have to do anything special there. Just do what you're supposed to do there, and then Marvin Harrison's going to catch the ball. Unfortunately, he just stepped out of bounds on that play. But I thought that was the best thing he did because it was the most on-schedule throw down the field that we saw where he was in connection with Marvin Harrison Jr. He, he made that safety freeze where he was, and he didn't think about it twice. He just went for it. Yeah, I think that that's a, that's a, that's a fair call, too. So here's my special. You kind of brought it up. It's the I I wanted to decide between the Mayan Williams wheel route because everybody loves a good wheel route, but also it takes some touch to throw that. So good, but I didn't take that one. I took the Chip Chanum throw where he's kind of moving around in the pocket and whatnot because the offensive line just did not do its job here. And so I think Josh Simmons got beat. And somebody else got beat up the middle. And so he evades all these guys and then makes the throw. He's got really special footwork. Some re- and I noticed that a couple of years ago, but Caleb Williams probably has the best footwork in college football right now. And it's kind of ridiculous what he does. But Kyle McCords is, a, is pretty elite. And we talked about this. Andrew brought this up. There's all sacks are not created equal. Sometimes it's on the quarterback. Sometimes it's on the offensive line. There were maybe three sacks that should have happened in this game because the offensive line didn't do its job, but Kyle McCord did what he needed to do to evade some guys and make sure it wasn't a sack, and then he moved the ball down the field. I think that's special because we saw how valuable that was for C.J. Stroud against Georgia on two of his touchdowns, making Jalen Carter miss. When your offensive line just gets beat by a better defensive lineman, it happens, and it doesn't matter because the footwork is so there, and you keep your eyes downfield, you don't run, and it ends up being a large strike down the field. It didn't gain heavy yards against Indiana, but that's something that's going to matter when you're playing Penn State and the defense they have. If you play Georgia, if you play Alabama, you play Michigan, that's special to me because that's the type of special stuff we were seeing from C.J. Stroud in the Peach Bowl. Yeah, and you know, if people remember I wrote a, a piece on Kyle McCord that went back to going back to the spring. It was kind of a you know how he got to that point, and one of the things that happened for him as a prospect was getting into the uh, in high school was feeling like he hit a wall a little bit mm-hmm. as far as his development. And one of the things that they specifically went and worked on with him was how do you you know go beyond just being a pocket passer? What is how are, how are you excelling outside the pocket? How are you doing the off platform stuff? And footwork is so critical to that. And and how you you turning your hips and and getting out and getting your feet planted and all that stuff like that that stuff that's that's critical to to being successful there because it's not it's one of those things where it, it has to look more uh, wild 
and loose than it actually is. It still is is still is based in in fundamentals. So I think that's a good pick. I think I would actually pick the wheel route though, <laughs> because <laughs> I think I keep going back to something that Ryan Day said on his radio show last week, which was they don't necessarily they don't need these guys to go out and make incredible plays. They have to go out and manage the offense as it's designed, manage the plays as they're designed, and that may sound like they're asking for a game manager. I don't because he's well, he literally used the word manage, but I actually don't think that that's what that necessarily means. I think mm-hmm. it means this offense as it's designed is going to ask you to make NFL throws and just we we've we've taught you how to make NFL throws. So mm-hmm. play discipline, play fundamentally sound and make NFL throws. And that isn't the kind of NFL throw like you know, the Justin Fields throwing from the one hash to the, the what did I say, throwing from the far hash to the far sideline or whatever um, on those bullets that, that Doug always used to talk about. And it's not C.J. Stroud and some of the things he used to do vertically. It still involves a lot of precision and touch and feel mm-hmm. for the game. And it, 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 I thought it was a moment where you saw where three years of being in the program pays off a little bit because I'm sure he's, you know, repped that throw now hundreds and hundreds of times over the past going on three years. And those things are crucial. It doesn't always have to be loud and with high velocity to be considered a high, um, a, a what do I say? Like a, a, a top shelf throw. And I thought that was an example of that. It, it involves having to, have a feel for your receiver and having a feel for just a, a, that that presence on the field. And I thought that was a good example of that. And I think that could be end up being his special trait that it's, it's not quite to the same, not quite in the same way that Stroud was because Stroud, as you were saying before, it was his, he, the way he saw the field and the way he could kind of visualize things was maybe his special trait and and I don't know that McCord quite has that, or at least has it yet. But as far as what could be his special trait for this year, it's like who most reliably and consistently executes the best option on, on of this offense. But he's not there yet. Like as we were saying before, mm-hmm. like he's got to get to that. But that's a that's a sign that he could get to that. I thought what's interesting is a lot of the plays we've been talking about. They came in moments they needed them. Absolutely. Like that Mayan Williams thing is a fourth down play. That chip training thing, I think it was a third down play or a fourth down play. Like these are late. It's like you have to have this or you're, ha- you're getting off the field type of plays in this situation. And we'll get into that in the second part of this of this conversation here. So we're, we'll take a break there. I, I think we're both, he was fine. He had some moments that made you feel like, okay, there's something there, but <laughs> it probably needs to take a jump. In week two, and it probably should it will because it's well, a, it's a less lower level of comp- competition, but it's a chance. It's, it's not even so much about it's a, a chance for him to build confidence because I thought when they were going tempo and going quick with it, and he was in rhythm out there. That's when you saw a lot of those throws and decisions start to happen. While early on in the game, it was a little more hesitant to do some stuff. Yeah, I it, I don't know what to think about Youngstown State. This seems like it. it <laughs> It, 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 no, but like, listen, like this seems no, it's like it's true. going to, it's going to be like, it, this could be one of the preseason scrimmages that we didn't get to watch is basically what we're going to get to watch next week yeah. to some extent, except their defenses won't be as good as, as the defense mm-hmm. that, that Ohio State's first team would have had to go against in said scrimmage. So that's probably not even fair. And it's, it's why I still think I'm, I'm really intrigued, like give Devin Brown you know, he, you know, Ryan Day said after this game, oh, he probably would have played like the third series. Mm-hmm. If you're, if you really are going to go with Kyle McCord, then I don't see any danger in just giving him the third series of this next game. There's, yeah. there's, especially if you, if like Kyle McCord goes just touchdown, give him touchdown. The if Kyle McCord goes touchdown, touchdown, drives for touchdowns, even if he isn't throwing them, uh, mm-hmm. drives for touchdowns, then. Give, and then Devin Brown gets that third series, and let's see what he really does with the first offense against a first defense, even if it's Youngstown State's defense, and and get that on film and let him build off that too. Because again, the the whole even if you're sticking with Comic Court, even if you already decided the Comic Court starting against Notre Dame, then you still want Devin Brown to get that experience and have that 
film to build on himself for when you need him if something happens with Kyle McCord. That's the, been the whole purpose of this all along is to develop two championship caliber starting quarterbacks. So you, I think they've got to be a little bit more forceful about getting Devin Brown more of that look. I don't see the downside. I only see. I honestly think one of them should play the whole first quarter and the other one should play the whole second quarter because the score does not matter. It does, the fact that one gets to be in the game when it's zero zero is irrelevant. It might as well already be thirty zero, when regardless of who's in the game. We'll take a break there. When we come back, <laughs> we'll get into some of the reasons why Devin Brown didn't play more because it had to do with nothing about what Kyle McCord was doing and a lot of what this offensive line was doing. So we'll get into that when we come back here on Buckeye Talk. <laughs> 